clap your hands and praise the Lord. You can be seated. We thank God. Come on and give God praise and honor. marvelous day that he's given us, even though it's uh, sleeting and raining outside, we thank him for the warmth of his spirit that is, exists in this place, and the power of his presence that we can feel here today. We thank God for this moment once again to stand in this place and, and enjoy coming to several times a year to preach the word of God and fellowship and worship at the Pilgrim Baptist Church. We thank God for for you. We thank God for the leadership, for the ministers of the gospel here, uh, the deacon leadership here and deacon trustees, and for Pastor Jones for opening the door once again to stand and share the word of God on this day. He is a dear friend. serves the Lord, and I celebrated with him as he made the mark of 25 years <laughs> of pastoring here at the great Pilgrim Baptist Church. This ministry has moved forward under his leadership, and I thank God for him today, and so my wife, Michelle talked to Pastor on last night as he was uh, inquiring about weather. I told him what I saw and what I had seen on the app. And, uh, and then he called me on my way here. So on last night as we talked and even on my way here, uh, we talked about uh, the safety, your safety is important. Try to take that in consideration, and particularly during the preaching of the word, so that we would get out a little earlier than we normally do. Maybe about five minutes early. <laughs> but he he has your best interest at heart and and safety, and so so I I'm to give you an abbreviated message today, not the full blown of it, but an abbreviated grateful to have my wife Nancy with me today. Nancy will be standing. I believe many of you have seen her and you know her. Uh, amen. Amen. Good to see some folks in the Williams family. Amen. Good to have the privilege of pastoring at the Pilgrim Baptist Church. Good to see you ladies. Amen. 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 If you got your Bibles, would you turn your Bibles to uh, the Gospel of Mark? Gospel of Mark chapter 1. as well, beginning at verse 40, where we find our scripture, I believe the custom of this house is to stand during the reading of the word. The reading says, now a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down to him and saying to him, if you are willing. You can make me clean. Then Jesus, moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing, be clean. As soon as he had spoken immediately, the leprosy left him and he was clean. And he strictly warned him and sent him away at once. And said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go your way, show yourself to the priests, and offer for your cleansing those things which Moses commanded as a 
testimony to them. However, he went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the message so that Jesus could no longer openly enter the city but was outside in desert places and they came to him from every direction. So in with the reading, you may be seated. I see this text today, this text really gives us lessons of a scarred man. Can you imagine walking down the street and hearing somebody cry out, unclean, unclean. That would be the prophetic cry of, of this leper. That whenever he came near human habitation, or when some passerby would venture too close, you would hear him say, unclean, unclean. Can you hear him saying, by the authority of the priests in Israel, I have been declared an outcast. It was also a warning that he would say when people would come near, he would say, I am to us today a menace. I am defiled. Come in contact with me and it's a disastrous thing. He says, my own children run from me as though from deadly serpents. Even my breath is seen as dangerous. I have to wear torn clothes and let my hair hang loose. My brothers and sisters, these and other measures were designed to guarantee that no healthy person would unwittingly contact defilement and coming in contact with a leper. This man was wretched in almost every sense of the word, exposed to suffering and indignities. It's safe to say that this man did not fit in. He did not fit in. Matter of fact, there's an article that appeared in the Chicago Tribune that ran the story about a health club that, was, that had a unique niche they, they reached out to people who normally don't feel comfortable joining a health club. That might be the case of some of us. The article opened with the following story by saying, Tara Lawton says that she quit going to the health club in part because she sensed she did not fit in. She said, people always seem to be staring and silently judging my 280-pound body. He says, then Lawton stumbled as she was on Facebook on this place called Downsize Fitness. Downsize Fitness is a discreet new gym in Chicago's West Loop that designed, that's designed exclusively for people who want to lose at least 50 pounds. She says, I want to cry sometimes at how it, was, how it has changed my life. She says, I work out now five days a week. I've lost 20 pounds since October. My body is responding positively to being pushed. She said, the hardest thing was getting through the door, but now I'm moving forward, and there's no way that I'm going back. Listen, this article, this article explored why downsized fitness is helping people like Tara. Although people are joining health clubs in record numbers, the number, this club usually featured attractive young men and women with perfect abs and toned bodies. The article reported that the industry is often perceived catering to the mostly fit, educated, and middle to upper class clients. But according to one fitness expert, most people don't buy that picture. They know it's not realistic. They, they don't think that they can achieve it. So fitness, the fitness industry, in its way is his own worst enemy. Unfortunately, many fitness clubs alienate people who need the most help. But downsized fitness is different. They welcome extremely unfit people and then walk beside them as they work through a program to get healthy and to shed pounds. 
In many ways, the story of Down South's fitness provides a good way to assess a church's approach to ministry. Are we perceived as catering mostly or only to those who are already spiritually fit? Or do we welcome the unspiritually unfit folks that are in the world? Some people who are embarrassed to come to church. Who do we really cater to? Are we, are we ready to walk beside spiritually unhealthy people as they pursue the path of spiritual growth? Or do we rather that they not come into our walls? Or do we rather that they come in already knowing how to function as a church member or as a disciple of Jesus Christ? Our text today reveals that Jesus welcomes the physically unfit, the emotionally unfit, and the spiritually unfit. Because in these verses, we have an intimate glimpse in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ that he had already had a long a day. He had already cleansed, if you will, many with unclean spirits. He healed Peter's mother-in-law. He healed many on the Sabbath and the sunset, and then finally he goes to get some rest. But even when he tries to get some rest, he finds that the crowd has come to find him. And there he is on another day, another busy day, just ahead was a hurt man, a man who only heaven could heal. Jesus came in contact with a man that needed his power, who needed only what God could supply. I believe that some of us have been in that situation, that we find ourselves knowing that the only person that could supply the need and bring us deliverance is Jesus Christ himself. Yeah, this man, this scarred man, this, this leper gives us some lessons. And the first lesson that we learn from this lesson from this leper is that we need to approach the Lord with confidence. Yes, approach the Lord with confidence. Notice, notice that when the news of Jesus' power had reached the isolated huts of the lepers, hope began to rage up. Hope began to stir up in that wretched community, especially particularly with one leper. For this leper's courage well so high that he was able to break through a society's cruel conveniences or conventions and cast himself at the feet of Jesus. Notice what the text says. There came a leper imploring, begging him, kneeling down to him and saying to him, if you are willing, you can make me clean. From, from, from where this leper sat, he, he might not have ever heard about Jesus healing, but he might have heard about the ability of Jesus to heal others. From what we get from this man, he, he plows his way through the crowd because he has a compass, if you will, that's set on Jesus. Why? Because he wanted healing. He wanted deliverance. And into the blank despair of life had come his way, we find a hint of hope and faith in one who had a blank stare, who had really no hope and cure in life. We find a man with faith and hope. Why do you say that? Because the text says he pleaded with Jesus. He pleaded with Jesus by saying to him, if you are willing, you can make me clean. He pleaded because he was not only dealing with, out, with an outward condition of leprosy, but I believe that he suffered inner scars. There was something outside, inside, that if because of what was on the outside, that caused him to have some scars on the inside. I think we can identify with that because many of us have gone through some stuff on the outside of life, but has left some deep wounds and scars on the inside of our lives. This, this man has some inner scars. He had lost identity. 
His dignity was destroyed. He was in isolation. He, he had the scar of feeling like he was a nuisance to society. He felt worthless. That's a scar. His scars ran deeper than his deliberating disease. But note his confession. Note his confession of faith that he was sure that Jesus could make him well. He said it there. He said, you can make me clean. Even though I've got scars, even though I seem to be in a hopeless situation, you can make me clean. He was asking for something that was unheard of, undreamed of. He believed that Jesus could do it. He wanted an outright miracle. You and I understand that the prerequisite for a miracle is a problem. Do you believe that God can perform miracles today? Do you believe that God can come through on your behalf? Do you believe that God can come through? Well, in order for a miracle to take place, you've got to have a problem. And many of us don't want to have any problems, but we want to see miracles. And if you want a miracle, you've got to have a problem. Because if you've got a problem, particularly when it's impossible, God can bring you out of it. This leper says, I've got a problem and I want deliverance. Ah, can I remind you today that the bigger the problem, the greater the potential of the miracle. This man was probably asking, are you willing to do this great thing for me? And probably the man knew that no other leper had been cleansed of Jesus. But he was asking, rather he was saying, I believe you can do it. Would Jesus feel that such an act was appropriate? Would he care enough? Or were the lepers beyond the pale of the concern of Jesus? Notice that he proclaims, I believe you can. You can make me clean. But watch what he also says. He says, you are willing. In other words, there was faith along with doubt. But how often does our faith proclaim he is able, but lacks the strength of appropriation? How many times have you and I cried, he's able? But then in the reality of what we're dealing with, we're wondering if God is willing. We're wondering if God will come through on our behalf. Yes, yes, we can have faith, but at the same time, we can have doubt. Just like the man who came to Jesus saying, I came to get my boy healed. But, but I'm wondering if you can do it. If, if you can do it, Jesus said to him, it's not whether you can believe that I can. As all things are possible with me, it's whether or not you can believe. Remember the man says, help my unbelief. And you and I have been in that situation before where we believe something, but yet we wrestle with self-doubt. We have doubt about God's power to do great things, even though we come to church Sunday after Sunday. Even though we study our words week after week, we sometimes have doubt when we're going through a real situation in our lives because we have not yet received the deliverance of what we're waiting for. This man had doubt, but he also had faith. And we experience an internal tug of war between belief and unbelief. Have you ever wondered if you are worthy to ask for what you need or if your past failures and wonderings have put you beyond the reach of God's help? Maybe today you feel unworthy to ask except for God to lift your heavy burdens from your life. So this leper cried out with assurance, with questioning of faith and doubt. He believed that Jesus could heal him. And I said the lesson that we ought to learn is that we need to approach God with confidence. 
We need to go to him even when our doubt might well up in our lives. We need to stretch out with confidence to believe that God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all that we could ask or think. We've got to believe that God can. So you've got to approach him. Even when your doubt is there, even when you're feeling a tug of war, you still got to stretch out on faith and say, I know you can. My friends, believe this, that the Lord delivers us not on the basis of our wealth or our worth, rather, but on the basis of his worth is not about us. It's all about him. Somebody ought to remember that today. It's not based on my worth. It's based on his worth. And this leper says to us today that approach him with confidence. The second lesson we learn from this scarred man is that we need to be assured of his compassion. Notice the text. The text says that Jesus was moved with compassion, that he stretched out his hand and he touched him and said to him, I'm willing, be cleansed. There was an agreement. But Jesus was touched. With his compassion. With the visceral action on Jesus' part, he, he felt it in his stomach. Jesus' reaction went beyond pity. It went beyond sympathy. It, 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 it even went beyond empathy. It was not just mind for mind. It was not hand for hand or even heart for heart. But understand, compassion is stomach for stomach, blood for blood, gut for gut. Jesus feels his way into the leper's knees. And what happens is when Jesus is moved with compassion, he is not the kind of God that leaves you in that condition. When he's been moved with compassion, he then moves with action. Amen. The text here says that he was not just touched with compassion in his stomach. The text says that his expression of his compassion expressed itself in deeds. Because don't you know that Jesus has taken our infirmities and has carried our diseases. He can identify with where we are. And then the Lord touched this man because that, that his compassion moved him, not just to look at him, not just to say, man, you're in a bad situation. You're in a bad predicament. No, when Jesus saw him and was touched with compassion, the text says he reached out and touched him. You and I have been around long enough to know that, that Jesus did not have to touch him. Did, did not have to put his hand on him to, to bring healing his way. He, he didn't have to touch him. He could have left him by himself. He could have left him in the situation. He could have just spoke a word and he would have been healed. But Jesus touched this man. This man evidently needed a touch. Amen. Some scars need the touch of God. Some hurts need the touch of God. Some situations need the touch of God. Some people need God's hand to reach out and touch them. A word will bring deliverance and set us free. But sometimes we just need a touch from the hand of God. Sometimes you need a touch from somebody who's right beside you. Sometimes you need a touch, not just a word, something to say, yes, I'm with you. Here was a man in isolation. Here was a man that felt that his dignity was gone, his destiny was gone, on his way to death's grave, but he needed a touch from God. And the Lord knew how to touch. Throughout the book of Mark, he touched. He touched Peter's mother-in-law. 
He touched Jairus' daughter. He laid his hands on a few sick and healed people. He reached out and touched the dumb man. He reached out and touched blind Bonimaeus. He reached out on a busy day and touched little children. He raised up his hands and touched and raised up people who were demonized. He had a way of touching. He had a way of touching that would make a difference in somebody's life. And, and there's a relevant application here for us that you and I need to be the hands of Jesus today. That we need to reach out and touch somebody who is in need of the touch of Jesus because some folks feel that they've got the touch to be to feel the hand of Jesus in their life. And you and I are the hands that can make the difference in somebody's life. Jesus touched this man because he needed a touch. He needed the hand of God. He needed, if you will, involvement a thousand times more than our theology. But we need to lay our hands on some rotten flesh. There's some folks in our neighborhoods who are going down, but they need our touch. There's some folks in executive offices that are going astray and they need our touch. There's some people who are working beside us in our cubicles, they need our touch. There's some folks in our neighborhoods, they need our touch. We are the hands that can reach out and touch somebody that can turn their life around. They, they need compassion. They need to see that the house of God is not a place that just preaches and teaches, but a place that shows deeds that Jesus is alive. see, our nervous system is wired to find satisfaction and discover for our own well-being by seeking the best for other people. Lessons from a scarred man. Approach the Lord with confidence. Be assured of his compassion. But finally, Anticipate the cure. Know that the Lord is going to cure. This man came for something that was undreamed of. He came with an uncurable disease. He came hoping that the Lord would touch him. And finally, the Lord touches him. And I want you to know today that when you are sitting and waiting for God to come through on your behalf, you've got to anticipate that the Lord is going to come through and bring the cure. You've got to anticipate that the Lord will bring the cure for your situation. You've got to anticipate even though it might have been six months, you might have been waiting a year, you might have been waiting for hours, but whatever the time length you've been waiting, you've got to keep on anticipating that the Lord will come through. Have you found out that the Lord will come through? Are there any witnesses in the house that say, I've been waiting for him. I had a problem, but he came through for me. I needed a touch, but he came through for me. I needed deliverance from my healing, but he came through for me. I needed a job, but he came through for me. I can anticipate his power will come through. When he touched the man, immediately his leprosy left him. His condition changed. Rotten flesh came back to become healthy flesh. He was able to move out of isolation and move back into society. When the Lord touches you, something happens. Something changes. Something moves within. You can't be the same. I don't know about you, but I know that he's touched me. And I am no longer the same. Has he touched you? Has he made a difference? Has he made a way in your life? Say yeah. Yeah. 
Hey, won't he do it? Can he do it? Even when you doubt him, can he do it? Let him touch you. Let him touch you. Anticipate that he will come through. He will come through. He will make a way. He will come through. Let's read from a psalm. This charge of deepening it will be sore on the outside. But Jesus knows how to see on the inside of our lives. And when he touches us, something happens. But what do I do? Approach him with confidence. Be assured of his compassion, but then anticipate the cure will come your way. God bless you. Hallelujah. 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 If he's touched you, you ought to say hallelujah today. If he's ever touched your life, you ought to give him praise today. If by the hand of God you are different than what you were when you came in. If you felt like an outcast, but he changed your life, you ought to be a witness in the house. Because somebody in here needs to have a witness that the Lord can make a way out of no way. And he can deal with the impossible. He can make a difference in your life. Hallelujah. 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 This morning, maybe this word has touched in somebody's life today. Maybe you're like the woman who said, I, I couldn't go to those regular gyms. And the hardest part was to push my way through the door. And maybe today you made your way through the door and you have heard that the church is a place for the unfit. You got to believe today that we are all unfit. For we all have fallen short of the glory of God. But by the hand and of Jesus Christ, we are saved today. So are you here today? Are you here? Are you here today? You're unfit. You need the touch of Jesus. I invite you today to come to Jesus. I invite you to come to the one who, who loves you. May we all stand. Maybe you're here today and you say, yes. I believe in Jesus Christ. I realize that I'm a sinner, but I want to be saved today. I want the Lord to, to change my condition, change my way. You've never personally, privately, or publicly accepted Jesus. Today, I want to invite you to a relationship with Jesus Christ. Maybe you're here today. You're saved, but you're not faithfully involved in a local church. Maybe you moved into this area and you have yet to join a congregation or join a church. I invite you today to become part of Pilgrim Baptist Church. Maybe you're here today and you need to restore your relationship to God. You strayed away from him. You moved away in your your posture with him. You're no longer where you were spiritually with him. But today you realize that I need to be back in relationship with him. Will you come? 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 Hallelujah. There's a brother coming. Come on, church. Give God praise. I'm still here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm still here. The Lord can make a difference. Come on. 
Come on, the Lord can make a difference. Come on, the Lord can make a difference. Come on, the Lord can make a difference. He can make a difference. Yes, he's got compassion. He's been touched with our infirmities. He knows what we go through. Come.